Straightallday.com. You are now tuned in to the show. You learned the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and offensively, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative, which is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And we put all this together into one bundle, one philosophy, one package, one mindset, one method, one approach, one way of living, one book. We got a lot of books, but one book specifically with this title, one daily masterclass, all under one umbrella that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is why fear can sometimes get control of you. Why does fear control you? Why does it control other people? What is the, what is the strength of this fear? We're all familiar with fear. We all know what it feels like. We all have um, been there at times. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe that's why you chose to listen to this particular episode. But we're going to dig into why fear is able to control people. Now, we all know what fear is. We know that fear is, though it's not a real thing, it's not a tangible thing, it's not something that we can hold in our hands, we all have experienced it. We have all experienced the feeling. The definition of fear here is an unpleasant emotion caused by belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain, or a threat. That's what fear is. It's something that we feel is an emotion that occurs within us. And us being human beings, we are emotion-based creatures. So emotions are not necessarily a negative thing. Emotion is not something that we can get rid of. You can't be completely uh, without emotion. Then you become a robot. And then, and we all know that the robots and computer chips are more efficient than we are. So if we didn't have emotions, then there'd be no need for us to even be here. So what we're talking about here today is why that fear controls us. and. I want you to, I'm gonna help you out, but I want you to deconstruct through some of the points that I'm gonna share here today, through all of the points I'm gonna share here today, how you can counteract, because we're gonna talk about why it's happening, and I want you to think about how you can counteract these reasons for why fear has been able to get control of you at different points and in different aspects of your life when we get into our points. Now, I have a text number where I want you to text me and tell me the best insight, the best idea, something you're going to do or think differently based on what you hear today. My number is 305-384-6894. Once again, that is 305-384-6894. So text me, tell me the best thing you got from today's masterclass. So let's get right into it. Point number one, the topic once again is why fear has had the power to control you. Number one reason is because you're human. Fear controls us because we are human beings. As I just explained, we are emotion-based creatures. So emotions are just part of the human, is just part of the human existence. So we can't eliminate this. If we want the emotion of happiness and joy and you know, excitement and feeling good and anticipation, then we also got to deal with the, the yin and the yang of that. We got to deal with sadness and frustration and we had to deal with fear and we had to deal with these other emotions that we may not necessarily want to feel, but they balance each other out, keeping the universe in balance. Napoleon Hill, in his classic book, Think and Grow Rich, he listed the six basic human fears. And the six basic, I actually don't even, most of the time when I mention these six basic human fears, I usually don't even mention all six of them. But I'm going to look them all up right now so I can tell you all six. But I know the top two because there were two that he talked about all the time. And those are the two that I usually mention. The number one fear that Napoleon Hill mentioned, this is nearly 100 years ago, at the height of the Great Depression in the late 1920s into the 1930s, was the fear of poverty, which made sense because of the time period in which he wrote the book. Everybody was afraid of losing all their money or maybe they had already lost all their money and they were dealing with the fear of how are they going to live? How are they going to you know, survive and sustain themselves and their families? with the fact that they were now living in poverty. There was no money out there, no money circulating in the, in the economy. And Napoleon Hill wrote that book based on the fact that he saw this fear uh, perpetuating itself throughout the entire country. So it made sense that that was the number one fear. Number two fear is the fear of criticism. Number three is the fear of ill health. And I think this one has jumped up a little bit on this list. We're gonna, we're gonna rejigger this list for 2000 and 2021. Actually, you know what? I might make a, I might do a whole masterclass just on these six basic fears. As a matter of fact, now that I'm talking about it, I am gonna do that. Third is fear of ill health. I'll give you the whole list anyway. Fourth is the fear of loss of love. Five is the fear of old age. And number six 
is the fear of death. So I think you know, today is, and right now, maybe not today, but right now, the world that we're in now, is a good time to rejigger these six basic fears. So that masterclass is on the way. So now you got an idea, something is coming on to work on your game masterclass. But the reason that I brought up this list is because the number two basic fear Napoleon Hill listed way back a century ago was the fear of criticism. And I feel, and this is something I've been saying for as long as this show has existed, I feel that the fear of criticism is now the number one basic fear that human beings have. I don't think, now I do think there are some people who live in fear of poverty. I think there are some people who have some negative money mindsets, as they say, still to this day. But I don't think it is as widespread as it was during the height of the Great Depression. It would make sense that a lot of people were afraid of poverty during the Great Depression. Right now, everybody's afraid of criticism during the Great what do we call it? We call this the great cancel, because right now that's what's happening. People are just getting canceled. People are having the, the receipts of things that they've done online or offline brought up and used against them now, nowadays from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whenever it happened. So nowadays is the fear of criticism. People don't say what they really want to say because maybe because of your job position, you can't say it because you won't have your job tomorrow if you do say it. They're doing things that they don't actually want to do, saying things they don't want to say, but because of your job position, because of your job title, because of the position you occupy, because of the people who follow you, you're expected to say it, so you're going out and saying things that you may not even really believe. Also, you can either avoid criticism or, you know, actually all to avoid criticism or to kind of calm down, to tamp down any kind of criticism that can come your way. This is one of the biggest reasons. I would say, not one of though, let me back up. The biggest reason in the world that we're in today, I'm recording this in 2021, this is the biggest reason that people are controlled by fear these days is because of the criticism that they want to escape and or avoid. This is number one fear right now. Social media, traditional media, cancel culture, online quote unquote receipts, or the fact that we're all interconnected makes every one of us extra cautious of saying or doing the wrong thing and thus getting attacked for it. This is the biggest fear right now, and this is controlling a lot of our actions, a lot of our words, and a lot of our thoughts. Human beings, we, are, we all know, we've heard and read that we are wired for fear going back to the quote-unquote caveman days, right? Back when we didn't even have human language. We would communicate with, who knows, human gestures and grunts, and we were wired for fear because it might be a saber-toothed tiger around the corner, and if one person in the tribe was afraid, then everybody needed to be afraid because they were afraid that fear might be the one thing that saves their lives. So everybody can run away from the, the saber tooth tiger or make sure we don't eat the poisonous berries before we die. So look, going back to the caveman days, we were wired for that fear. The thing is, the world that we live in today, for 99% of us, any of you who's listening to this show, I'm going to say close to 100% of us, those dangers from the back then in the caveman days, those dangers no longer exist. All right? Your life is not on the line every single time you leave your house. And if you have, and the reason I'm able to make that statement because you have the luxury of listening to a master class or what some of you will call a podcast on a daily basis, okay, you're, you're not living in a war zone, all right? Your life is not that much in danger because if it was, you would not have had the time to be listening to this show. You have other much more urgent things on your mind. So those, since those dangers no longer exist, the thing is that energy that is ingrained in us, it's just part of our wiring as human beings, that energy still has to go somewhere. Now, some of us have more of it than others, and some of us are more, uh, we have more acute uh, understanding, more acute consciousness of that energy than others have, but the energy has to go somewhere. And what many people do who have a lot of this energy and they're very conscious of it, they just find new things to be afraid of, such as criticism, such as these other six basic fears that Napoleon Hill weighed out. And again, I'm gonna do a whole masterclass just on those six basic fears and we're gonna change the order of them. Thank you to Napoleon Hill for that. But people just find new things to be afraid of and then here's what they do because people are pretty smart, right? I would assume you being a very smart person, I know you're smart because studies say people who listen to podcasts, again, this being a masterclass, don't, don't label us a podcast, but people who listen to these type of shows are generally, according to studies, relative to the wider population, smarter, uh, higher, more higher educated and make more money than people who do not listen to podcasts. And again, I didn't make that up, but even if I did, you would probably accept it, wouldn't you? So because these people are so smart, here's what they do. They come up with logical explanations for their fear. See, if someone is afraid of something that just seems illogical, well, I'm afraid of speaking my mind on Instagram because a bunch of people on Instagram might come into my comment section and attack me and ridicule me and just come at me 
and I don't want to, so I don't want to have to deal with that. So I'm not going to say what I want to say. Most people would never make that statement. What I just said, most people would never admit to that, even though that's the reason why they're not saying what they really want to say. What's their logical explanation? Their logical explanation is something smart that just makes sense that gives them an excuse for not saying what they really want to say, but they're not going to come out and say it's fear. I'm afraid of the crowd. I'm afraid of criticism because then they, you sound stupid, right? You sound like a little kid. I'm afraid of being criticized. You sound like a five-year-old, but you could be 35 years old with the same fear because again, it's part of your wiring it has nothing to do with your age, the number of candles on your cake. And we just come up with, it's an emotional reason. We have purchased the emotional reason. And then we come up with a logical explanation for the decision that we made. As they say in the sales world, people make decisions with emotion and we justify with logic. It's the same people do, same thing people do when it comes to dealing with fear. We made the decision to be afraid and then we just come up with a logical, smart explanation for why we are afraid that sounds acceptable, sounds all neat and acceptable and passable in you no know, everyday conversation, but this is the real reason. And that's why the show exists for us to dig into it. Point number two, today's topic once again is why fear controls you. People are addicted to safety or what they believe is safety. Sometimes we're addicted to just the illusion of safety is even a better way of saying it. When you play it safe in life, whatever you consider to be playing it safe, because we all, again, we have different scales, different barometers of what safe is and what safe is not. But when you do what you would consider to be playing it safe in life, you put yourself in a position to where you are never at risk of losing. I mean, that's the very point of playing it safe, right? So that you can never lose, or so you think. You think you're putting yourself in a position to where you never lose. The, what you're not noticing is that in the bigger picture of things, you're losing every single moment that you don't put yourself in a position to risk losing. And let me explain to you what I mean. The most dangerous thing you can do in life is to continually all the time play things safely. Because when you play it safe, you never put in the you never put yourself in a position to where you could lose. But at the same time, again, as we got to remember, there's the yin and the yang. There's the balance of the universe, the balance of life. If you can't possibly lose, that also means you can't possibly win. So you can't be the champion in boxing unless you get in a ring with somebody who might be able to beat you in a boxing match. You got to beat them to be the champion. But also you got to deal with the fact that you're fighting somebody who could just as easily beat you. That's the risk that you must deal with. You must accept that risk in order to put yourself in a position to win. Some people spend their entire lives or their entire careers never positioning themselves to where they could lose because of that fear of losing or their addiction to safety, though actually both two sides of the same coin, because they're addicted to the safety of never wanting to put themselves in a position where they could be beaten, to where they could lose something, whatever that something happens to be. But because you did that, now you also can't win. You are not eligible to win unless you make yourself eligible to lose. That's the way that it works. And that's a good quote right there. When you play it safe in life, you don't lose, but you also don't win. And the biggest danger you can put yourself in, in life, paradoxically, is to never position yourself to win. Because what happens is you get to the end of your life and, hey, maybe you never did lose. Maybe you did play it safe. Maybe you stayed safe your entire life. But who gives a damn about that life? Or who's, who wants to read a book about that? Who wants to know anything about the story of someone's life who never put themselves in the position to win? Who wants to hear about somebody who never put themselves in the position where they could possibly lose? I did in episode 1326, told you how to live a life worth reading about. Again, it's episode 1326. And I don't even remember everything that I said in that episode. When you got this many episodes, you're probably not going to remember every single point. But one thing I hope I said in that episode, and if I didn't, then I need to do another one. I need to do a follow-up, is you got to put yourself in a position where you could possibly lose. As I told you uh, many episodes back, episode 1142, how to be a champion in life, you got to put yourself in a position where, or you have to be in a position, maybe not put yourself there, but be in a position where it looks like you're going to lose, but you end up winning. That's what makes you a champion in life where it looks like you can't succeed, but you end up succeeding anyway. The first person I ever heard say that was Damon Dash, who was the subject of Virtual Mentors episode number four, way back in episode 488, Damon Dash Virtual Mentors episode. Here's what he said. You ain't a champion, so it looks like you're gonna lose, but then you end up winning. And the only way you can be in a position to look like you're gonna lose is you gotta take a risk in life. And anyone who is controlled by fear, thusly, they don't ever put themselves in a position where they could possibly lose. They never take any risk. Well, you can never be a champion. 
Now, maybe you can be okay. You could be all right. I mean, you can, you can be in the game. You can be, I guess, somebody. I don't know, depending on what, however you use that word. But you can't win if you don't risk losing. This is the game that we're in, everybody. Now, me being a, an entrepreneur, this is one of the risks you take when you get into entrepreneurship. The very definition of entrepreneurship is starting a venture while at the same time taking on normal and greater financial risk. You're putting yourself in a risky position just by being an entrepreneur. It's, again, the very definition of the word. doesn't mean you have to take crazy gambles with your money, but it's the, the very definition of how it works. And if you're not willing to take that risk, then okay, you don't have to get into the game of entrepreneurship, but at the same time, you put yourself in a position where hey, somebody else may be able to control your fate. And you can read up on that on your own time. When you play it safe in life, this is, we're still on point number two here, that's the biggest danger that you can put yourself in is to never step out of that safety. Again, there are times in life that you do want to be safe. When, you, when I get in my car, I put on my seatbelt. When I go to sleep at night, I lock the doors to my place. All right, there are times in life where it does make sense to be safe. At the same time, there have to be times when you step out of that safety. Otherwise, you can't ever win. And never winning is probably the riskiest position, again, you can live your whole life through. Number three, today's topic, once again, is why fear controls you and others. Number three, people feel that they have something to lose. People who are controlled by fear allow that fear to slow them down and stop them from doing things because they're like, well, look, I got something to lose. So that's why you know, I'm playing this thing a little bit safe. Although the thing that they feel like they could lose isn't even what they want. Let me say that point again, because I want to make sure you got what I'm saying here. Some people are controlled by fear throughout their lives because they feel as if they have something to lose. So they are afraid of losing that something. The thing is that something that they don't want to lose isn't even something that they want. They're not even that excited about the something. But whatever that something is, they want to hold on to it. So they're holding on there, as the saying goes, tiptoeing through life just to arrive safely at death. They're not even excited or happy or that proud of the little that they have, but they're so afraid of losing even that little that they basically hold themselves back just to hold on to it. This is the paradox of playing it safe in life, as we just talked about in point number two. You get so used to what little that you have that you start to fear losing that little and then you'll fight tooth and nail just to defend that little bit that you don't even like, even when it's far from your ideal situation. Now, how many people do you know who have fit that description? How many times maybe have you been that person? All right, um, you're in this situation. You're in this, this box, this situation in your life. You're not even excited about, about the situation. You're not that excited about these people who you're around. You're not that excited about this circumstance that you have allowed yourself to be in and you remain in. But because you're so afraid of even losing that, this little situation that you have that you don't even like, you will do whatever you got to do and fight tooth and nail just to stay in this situation. I told you in episode number 1207. Do not settle for good enough out of fear that you won't find better. This is an episode that you should refer yourself back to over and over and over again, especially any of you who finds that you may have this fear addiction. And I talk about the fear addiction in my book, Work On Your Game as well, which you can get at workonyourgamebook.com. Settling for good enough out of fear that you won't find better. And some people settle for even less than good enough. You settle for mediocre. You settle for not too good. You settle for it's just okay out of fear that that void, the fear that people actually have is not even that they won't find better, it's the fear of the void, it's the empty space of having nothing in the moment. You might have a job that you hate, but you won't quit the job because you don't wanna be jobless for a minute. Now maybe that's a, a money thing, maybe it's not a money thing, maybe it's just a, it's an emotional thing. And I think the people use something like money or time. These are the two common excuses that we get, especially any of you as a salesperson or an entrepreneur, you know. These are the two excuses people give you all the time for not doing something is money or time. Usually it's not money or time. Money and time are logical justifications for emotional reasons. The reason people really don't do things are the, is the fear that is holding them back. And then they use money and time as a logical thing because usually other people will accept Oh, I don't have the money, I don't have the time, as a logical justification for why they're not doing the thing that they really want to do. Listen, all of us can find the money or find the time when we really want to do something. If we really don't want to do something, 
all of us can use money or use time as an excuse for not doing it. Now, that's something that you really want to have to deal with yourself because nobody can really tell you that you have time. Nobody can really tell you that you can go find money or that you have money. Only you know. But you know the truth if you're bullshitting yourself. So that's why this show right here, I always, as I say all the time, we always bring it back to the individuals. I'm talking directly to the individual here. This is not about other people. It's really about you. Point number four. Today's topic, once again, is why fear has taken control of you. Number four, commitment issues. People are, are controlled by fear because they don't want to commit. Because when you commit, you're in. And you can't get out. When you commit to something, that means this is the thing that you're going to do. This is the place that you're going to be at. This is the way that you're going to, this is what you're signing on to. This is what you're hitching your wagon to. And whatever happens here, you're there. And some people are so afraid of committing to anything because something might not work there. Something may go wrong there. Something may make them look bad in that space. They don't ever commit to anything, so they kind of just play the, the open space forever. Thing is, because you never risk losing, you also never risk winning. When you commit to something, you're accountable for whatever happens in that space. And many people are afraid of anything that they will become, quote, stuck, close quote, with. So they never commit to anything. Now, while that can be a good position in some cases, there are times in life when it does make sense to not commit to anybody. Let's say you got a bunch of people arguing with each other and you're trying to mediate the conversation and get everybody on the same page. It'd probably be a good idea to not pick sides because then the person whose side you didn't pick will think you're just against them. It'd be good to stay in the middle. It'd be good to stay neutral in a situation like that. It is, so it's good in some situations to stay neutral. But there is also a time to use that knowledge and there's also a time to not use that knowledge. That's the height of wisdom is knowing when and when not to use knowledge. A writer by the name of James Altucher, he's written a couple books, has a, a show of his own, and he writes a lot of articles that I like reading. He talked about, or he tells the story how he was living in Airbnbs for years. So he had a, a place, maybe a house, an apartment, whatever it was. He gave up his house or his apartment. He put all of his belongings into one uh, heavy-duty garbage bag this is a true story and he moved into an airbnb and he had enough money to move into pretty much whatever place he wanted but he just decided to do this so he moved into an airbnb and as he told the story the way he told it he would live in a certain one for like a month or a few weeks then he would move to a different one then he would move to a different one he just kept going from airbnb to airbnb and he did this for a couple of years and I believe it was the Wall Street Journal wrote a story about him. It might have been the New York Times, one of those New York papers. This is in New York. He was doing this. He would go to different places. Like I think he spent some time in South Florida. I met James down in South Florida uh, a time. And he wrote this story. He's telling this story. How he's moving around to these Airbnbs and how fun it was, how it was this. People called it minimalism. He didn't really call it that. He just wanted to, he just didn't want to live in an apartment anymore. He didn't want to be connected to any place anymore. He didn't have, you no, know, he wasn't married in a relationship. He has kids, but his kids are with his uh, ex-wife. So he's like, All right, let me just do this. And while he's doing it, one of his female friends saw the way that he was living and advised him slash warned him that no woman would ever want to get in a relationship with a man who didn't even have a place to live. Now, again, while technically he could afford a place to live, he just wasn't living anywhere. He's just bouncing around from place to place. And I actually, I agree with what this woman, his friend's assessment was like, all right, if a woman's looking at this man, he doesn't even have a place that he stays. He just moves around and has all his stuff in one garbage bag. Like, who is this guy? Like, how can I commit to this guy? He won't even commit to anything himself. And that made sense. So James decided, he took his friend's uh, warning. He heeded the warning slash advice, moved into a place, you know, got himself a little bit of furniture. Eventually he found himself a relationship and he actually got married. Now the Airbnb life was fun, I'm sure. It's something that sounds like a, a fun experiment for somebody to try out. I personally love staying in Airbnbs. When I travel, most of the time, unless I go somewhere like, there's certain places where I, I'll usually grab a hotel. If I'm in like New York City, Vegas, those are the two places usually where I'm probably gonna angle towards a hotel. But anywhere else, I like staying in Airbnbs. But I also, at the same time, when I'm done with that hotel or that Airbnb, I like to actually come back to home. I like to have a place where, you know, there's a closet and my clothes are in there and I can leave stuff there. I can travel, come back, and everything's still there. I like, I like somewhere that I'm committed to. And a lot of times, people are controlled by fear because they don't want to commit to anything because, again, when you're committed to something, you got to deal with everything that goes on in that place. And some people don't want to handle that. They don't want that responsibility. 
but understand that with responsibility, that ability to respond comes power. If you want power in life, you gotta accept responsibility. You want responsibility, you gotta commit. So all of these work together in a chain. All that said, let's recap today's class, which is why fear may have taken control of you. Number one reason, because you're human. Pony Hill and Think and Grow Rich and Listed Fear is the number two basic fear. I believe, not fear, fear of criticism rather, is the number two basic fear. I believe is down to number one because all of our social interconnectivity has caused many of us to be afraid of what somebody else, most of the time people we don't even know, will say about us. And that goes back to, our, that triggers our wiring from back in the caveman days, quote unquote, when fear was the main thing that kept us alive. These days, fear doesn't keep us alive. Fear just keeps us constricted. Point number two, people are addicted to safety or what they believe is safety, that illusion of safety. The most dangerous thing you can do in life is playing it safe because while you are in a position that you can't lose, you're also in a position where you can't win. And not positioning yourself ever to win is the worst thing you could do for yourself in life. Number three, people fear they have something to lose. Though, what they could lose isn't even what they want. And the paradox of paying, playing it safe is a little bit that you have, you become so connected to it that you'll fight tooth and nail to keep it even though it's not even what you want. And number four, commitment issues. When you commit to something you're in, you can't get out, and you're accountable for everything that happens around it. Many people don't want that responsibility, but they don't realize while staying away from responsibilities that they're also banning themselves from ever being able to access power. If you want power, you must accept the responsibility. If you want responsibility, you must commit. All that said, text me and tell me the best thing you got from today's masterclass. What are you going to do differently? How are you going to change the way you think based on what you heard today? My number, 305-384-6894. Again, 305-384-6894. Send me a text and work on your game. Dre, all day.